Feels like it's been a long time for me, but good morning, church. I just wanted to say, start by saying thank you so, so much for the incredible amount of support and the prayers and the letters and the gift cards, but most importantly, all the good food that you have brought us in the last couple weeks. I can tell you that I have more food in my house than I know what to do with. So what I was thinking, if you're hungry after church, I want you to come and get some food. But I just want to say I'm so grateful. We've just felt so incredibly supportive. Um, for those of you that don't know, my dad went on to be with the Lord. And I feel like I've got an important word today, so I don't want to take too much time here, but I just want to encourage you with some things that the Lord did. Um, as some of you know, my dad was a Vietnam vet, and he was shot in the war. He was gut shot, so he was disabled his whole life. Never really got connected to a church or a church family. Uh, he was a great man, full of integrity and honor, and he sacrificed by adopting me when I was five years old. But the last couple years, he really had a faith awakening and it was his desire to come to church one Sunday, but he just kept getting worse and worse. And so he asked me, would you baptize me? And it was one of the great honors of my life. We actually took a picture here, but um, it's so crazy how the Lord and the Holy Spirit can prompt you. But it was, it was the day before he passed, and it was the afternoon, and the Lord said, it's now. And thankfully, we had our, our neighbors, Paul and Lynn Cuco there. But this is a picture um, when we baptized him. And it was so incredibly special. And, um, and so I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for praying for me in this time. But I'm here to tell you that I know the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And my father is looking into the face of Jesus right now. And because of that, we can rejoice. And, and, and it just, there was so much. The, the, um, the National Guard drove five hours um, to come and honor him. And we have this picture where I was able to receive the flag, and the officer said these words to me. He said, Men like your father, women in the Vietnam War, when they came back, they were not honored properly. And I said, how is it that you drove five hours? He said, they were not honored properly coming home, and we were going to make sure that he was honored on the way out. And I just thought that was so powerful. It was... And so... Um, Yes, so let's, let's get to work here. Uh, it's been two weeks, and I'm very, very excited. I got about a two-and-a-half-hour sermon coming. <laughs> I want to preach, but I'm going to try to do my best to get through it. Um, so we're continuing the sermon series in the book of Philippians. It's been rich. We've talked about the gift of joy. We've talked about the, uh, the power of God in joy. We've talked about his sovereignty in all circumstances. We've also talked about God's commitment to finish what he's began in us. Um, I think as Dustin said today, he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And today in chapter 2, we're we'll talking about something incredibly important inside the body of Christ. It's so important that the Apostle Paul, if you look through his letters, it was one of the greatest themes in all 13 of his letters. You hear it over and over and over again. In chapter 2, we're gonna, he's driving home the importance of unity inside the body of Christ. That's the word for us today. Our unity in Christ is critical to the church fulfilling its God-given purpose of winning people to Jesus. And he's reminding us. He's reminding the church of Philippi and he's reminding the church of the Outer Banks that our unity is actually the key to our effectiveness of our witness in this world. 
as we look at the words of Jesus himself in John 17, where you see how important this is. In John 17, Jesus is praying high priestly prayer. He's not only praying for his believers, he's praying for us. And he says, so that they may be brought to complete unity, then the world will know that you sent me. So Jesus and Paul are saying the same thing, that our unity inside the body of Christ is our most effective witness to this divisive and lost world. If you believe that, someone say amen. amen. Our unity is our greatest witness. And what an incredibly timely word for us to hear in the body of Christ. I think you would agree with me that we live in a world that is so divided. It's growing more and more polarized and fragmented. And sadly, church, it's even happening among believers. It's happening inside the church. This is exactly what Paul is addressing. Disunity, factions among believers. He's speaking to Christians. And sadly, it's happening, and it's ramping up right now because it's election year. Just to get the elephant out in the room. This is election year. I have decided I am already off social media. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I can't take it. And I see it's getting heated. And I remember in the last election, I was so incredibly disappointed with Christians and some of the ways, not that we're not allowed to disagree or take stands, but everything we are to do is supposed to be in love. That we win people with our compassion and our sacrifice and our unity. And so when we're getting on spouting off all these things, giving in to the flesh, guess what happens? People are like, I knew I didn't want anything to do with the church. And Jesus said it. So don't y'all be mad at me, okay? This is Jesus. I mean, it's interesting, you know. Um, my brother came down for the funeral, right? Love my brother, but we can get into a quick argument. Um, I see him, and it was not, how are you doing, buddy? It was not, it's great to see you. It was not, I've been praying for you. Right out of his mouth, as soon as I saw him, guess what he asked me? Who are you going to vote for? <laughs> are you serious? That's the first thing out of his mouth. Who are you voting for? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do this. I, and I told him I'd rather not do this. And he just starts in on me. And he says, this is a Christian. This is passive. I thought you were a leader. And then he said, kind of fighting word, he said, I guess you're just another sheep. And I'm like, oh, no, you didn't. Only God calls me a sheep. <laughs> and he's starting to go in at me, and he says, what are you afraid of? And I looked at him, I said, I'm afraid of punching you in the face. <laughs> this is five minutes together. He said, you're not informed about the issues. And I felt like the enemy had his trout rod and he was baiting me, jigging the bait. You like that, Greg? Is that how you do it? He was jigging. You think I don't know how to jig? I know how to jig jig. I can't dance, but I can jig. All right. Listen, stop laughing. He was just, <laughs> and I had this thing in me that I wanted to indulge in my flesh. Yes, I know the facts. I know the facts better than my brother knows the facts. And I have strong convictions biblically. But my brother had just become a Christian. And I knew what the enemy was up to. And I decided to listen to the book of James 
slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to become angry. And because I was willing to lay down my flesh, we were able to have an incredibly loving conversation about Christ. So, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. The spirit of division is at work in this world. Make no mistake, though, the source of that division, the author of division is Satan. We're fighting flesh and blood, but behind the division, the divisiveness, and I'm not not just talking about disagreements. It's okay in the body of Christ. But behind the divisiveness is Satan. His name actually, diabolos, in Greek, means to divide. His very name. The enemy's chief tactic is division. And you see it all the way back to Genesis, where he's sowing division and discord between Adam and Eve and God. That is how he plays the game. People say, oh, the, the Bible's not relevant for us today. Is this not an important word for the body of Christ right now? We need to hear it just as much than when it was written over 2,000 years ago. So buckle up. Hear the Lord Be reminded that we have to be alert and aware and stand against divisiveness. The Bible actually says there's seven things that God hates. And the very last thing is someone who stirs up division. God is a God of unity, church. And his objective is to unite and complete And Satan's objective is to divide and conquer. And you need to understand that. Moving into this election time, we've got a couple months. And I think by the way that we act, we could actually win people to Christ. That we could win people to even come into this church when they see our unity, not our divisiveness. Are you still with me? Okay. So I want to challenge you. As Christians, we have a higher calling. We have a biblical calling not to agree with everything. That's not the idea of unity. But to stay unified. Not unity at expense of truth. So if you're already going there in your mind, oh, Pastor Jamie, he's Pat, no, no, no. Not unity at expense of truth. We never compromise truth. But unified in our love for one another, unified in our purpose to glorify God and make disciples. We have a calling, and it's higher than political alignment. We, do I love patriotism? Oh, absolutely. My father. But we have a higher calling. You know what Paul says? We are citizens of heaven first. And that is the king that I submit to. Jesus is the only thing that can truly fix the systemic problems of our world. I will, Gary. I will for 14 hours. No, <laughs> it's just so good to be back. Um, so, this is what Paul says in Ephesians. Okay, Ephesians um, chapter uh, four, verse three. It's all through his letters. He says, "Make every effort." I love that what he talks about an active effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. That, that unity is actually something that we have, to, we have to fight for at times. Unity is things something we have to humble ourselves at times. Sometimes unity looks like you forgiving someone. Sometimes unity looks like laying down your need to be right. 
but we have to make the effort to keep the unity because the enemy's howling. Make it your priority. Fight for unity and includes humbling yourself. I will be honest here. Early in my life, I had the problem that I always needed to be right. And God wanted to heal me of this, so he gave me a spouse. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? And I quickly learned I am never right. Is that Kimber laughing or is that you, Kara? Okay. It's interesting, uh, the first job I ever took, Kimber and I were co-leading youth ministry. And uh, if you don't know me, I'm super competitive in a lot of different things. And we had this Bible trivia night in front of the youth group and they were asking us a question. And, and, I, and I knew I was right. And I ended up being right. And I grabbed the mic and I, I, I held it up to Kimber's face and I said, tell everybody who's right. You know where this is going? So I came home and there was a pillow and a folded blanket on the couch. And there was a yellow sticky note that said, Mr. Wright, enjoy your time on the couch. Love, Kimber. One of the things we need to do is we need to lay down our need to be right all the time. We got to learn to lay it down. We have to understand that without love, we're a resounding gong. Love has to bind the things that we do, or the world is never going to see a picture of the image of Christ. And it involves humility, church. It involves the attitude of humility where you honor others above yourself. In this time of unparalleled disagreements, reminding you of James, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to post on Facebook. (laughs) And slow to become angry. Listen to the word of the Lord. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Make that be the mantra Make it be the motto of your life that you, even in someone you disagree with, you are willing to listen and you're willing to sacrificially love. There are several people in my life and and one pastor that I routinely meet with that we are completely in different sides doctrinally. And I'm not just talking about types like tongues. I'm talking about real, real stuff. But I have decided that I was going to meet with him and I was going to love him and I was going to listen to him and I was going to try to encourage him in order to win a friendship that he might be able to hear what I say. You hear me, church? All right. Maybe there's someone like that in your own life. So let's go to Philippians chapter 2. You can turn there if you like. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 4, but really you know what? I got something for you. I haven't done this yet as a pastor, but I want to do it right now. I have a vision for you. People always ask me, Pastor Jamie, what's the vision? What are some of the vision you have for us as a church? Well, here's what I come up with. I have a vision for you in this time, and I'm going to read it to you. This is my vision for you as we move into unparalleled times of division. This is a vision for our church, and I believe it's from the Lord. May our love for Christ And Christ's love for us foster a unity that bears witness to the gospel of hope, which we hold out to a weary and divided world. Amen. Amen. May our love for Christ and Christ's love for us foster a unity that bears witness to the gospel of hope, which we hold out to a weary and divided world. You think we're packed now? You start following. You start loving. You start sacrificing. You start listening. There will never be enough chairs in church because it's so beautiful when Christians come together in unity. Amen. Okay, Philippians 2, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. 
This is a really, really important word for us, okay? Um, here we go. This is Paul, chapter 2. He says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, look at verse 2, then make my joy complete, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to our own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. So we're going to be talking about that. What a powerful word. Understand Paul starts with, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, this is a very important point, that unity is not unity for unity's sake. Unity, true unity, is found in Christ. You can't find biblical unity outside of Christ. That's the thing that really pulls us together. This, and we're going to really dig into verse 2. He says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. He says, make my joy complete. He says, what does a healthy church look like? Because Paul was concerned about the church being healthy. And what does a healthy church look like? A healthy church looks unified. And so he says these things. He says, being like-minded, having the same love, being in full accord, and having one in mind. Church, this is not political unity. This is not cultural unity. This is unity of heart and mind. This is what the Bible calls oneness. And what's amazing, if you study the life of Christ you see this call of unity the night before Jesus was crucified with his disciples in a Passover meal. He has this high priestly prayer in John 17, and he's praying for his disciples, and he's praying for us. And you start asking the question, what would you, what is he praying for on the night that he passes? What does he want for us? Because he's very clear. I'm going to read it to you. This is in John 17. Incredibly powerful moment. He's praying for his disciples. This is verse 20 through 23. He says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved me. So at the end of his life, the thing that he's praying for, church, the thing that he wants us to have is the thing that I'm preaching to you today. He wants us to be one. He wants us to be unified in such a way that the world sees their witness and people come to Christ. This is what oneness is about, and oneness was their power. The strength was in their togetherness. Do you know that for the body of Christ to fulfill our purposes, we need to function in unity? And someone can say amen to that. For us to really fulfill what God's called for us, we have to function together, meaning that we need each other. And that's the metaphor that Paul uses when he says the body of Christ. And the beautiful thing about this church is that it's unity in the midst of diversity. Have you ever wondered how Christianity spread like a wild fire? that historians will say by the end of the second century, half of the Roman population was converted to Christ. Have you ever asked yourself the question, how did that happen? 
Yes, the Holy Spirit was moving, but what was the Holy Spirit doing? He was bringing all these people groups, ethnicities, languages, Jews and Gentile, bringing them all together. And the world, the Romans, they would look at their unity and they would say, we have never seen anything like this. And the unity of the church was actually winning souls. So unity was their catalyst. Um, I want to give you this illustration, uh, very powerful. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about this as, in terms of the church. Um, and it's, it really hit me. I did a lot of study this week. But do you know one of the powerful witnesses that we can have is when the world sees the church's unity in the midst of diversity? When the body of Christ comes together in all different parts as one. And as I was studying this, um, I, I found this apt illustration of a symphony orchestra. Has anyone in here ever been to an orchestra for? Are they not absolutely incredible? I'm here to tell you, I am actually starting to like classical mu music. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't know what's happening to me, but this week I've been listening to Bach and Mozart and these different things, and I, I've just been so overwhelmed with how incredibly powerful they are all these different parts working together in harmony. And as I was studying these men, Mozart's one of them, Kimber and I were talking about that. Do you know that he was a strong Christian? And one of Mozart's things, he says, when I, when I play, I want people to see the Lord. He actually has this quote, and he says, I wish the whole world would hear the power of harmony. How is the world going to hear the power of harmony? when they hear the church come together. Come on, I'm preaching good. Listen, have you ever seen a full-size orchestra? They're absolutely incredible. There are 80 to 100 different musicians, 80 separate instruments on stage. There are four groups. There are strings, the violin, the cello. There are woodwinds, the flute, and the clarinet. There is brass, the trumpets, and the horns. And there's percussion, the, the bass drum. And they all come together in a cacophony of sound. And it's amazing. All of these different people with all of their different instruments, they are all led by the conductor, and they find the same tune. So I'm going to show you one of this incredible video of one of Mozart's pieces I just want you to watch. You can hit the lights. It's super powerful, and watch the unity and diversity. that powerful <laughs> isn't that incredibly powerful 
man, as I watch that and I watch the conductor and he's the violins and the flutes and the cellos and the bass drum and they're all different, but they're all with one tune and one purpose, following the conductor. And I said, what a perfect illustration of the church. That our conductor, Jesus Christ, has a way with the Holy Spirit of gaining us together, using our differences, that we might be able to sing the most beautiful song for the world to hear. And let me tell you, church, the world needs to hear our song. It's the song of the redeemed. And so I want to encourage you, if you're not involved with this church, if you have a gift, we need your gift. The thing about the symphony is that everybody has to play together for the melody and the harmony. This is the illustration of the church. So whatever your gift is, get involved. You see Brittany and Jess, and they're using their voices. And you see Dustin up here praying, and I'm preaching. And you hear that, you, you know, that the kids' ministry in the back, God bless them. They're herding cats. <laughs> all these different people, but they're all using their gift. And it is a sound the world needs to hear. It, it is the key to our witness, the song of the redeemed. And you might say to me, Pastor Jamie, wouldn't it be great if we had a picture of what that unity looked like? Wouldn't it be cool to have a picture of this unity, what we do in the book of Acts chapter 2? If you want to know the strength of the early church was the concophony, the, the, the idea that the Jesus brought them together with multi-ethnicities, with different languages, with different cultural practices, bringing them together. And let me read it to you. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All, can we say this together? All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's how they lived. They didn't have this individualistic Western mindset. They were together or not at all. They knew that there's no way that they could have a witness in this world unless they were together. And so they pushed divisiveness out. And God brought unity and oneness in. And there were so many people that the church spread like a wildfire. I long to see the church operating with this heart. Do you agree with me? Do you believe that it's God's will to see the church functioning together in harmony? Should somebody say amen if you believe it. Amen. That's God's heart. It's the purpose of today's sermon. And we got to fight for it. There were Jews, there were Gentiles, there were poor, there were rich, there were different ethnicities. I think about the people that Jesus brought together. Matthew was a tax collector. Simon was a zealot. I don't know if you can understand that. Matthew was a guy who worked for the Roman government. Simon was an insurrectionist. They were in a small group together. <laughs> an insurrectionist and a tax collector. And they got unified in Christ. The Jews and the Gentiles, they couldn't be more different. But because of the Spirit of God... There was a common purpose. There was a common heart. There was a common mind. That's the goal. And I want to tell you a little bit as I kind of come to a close here. I got to clarify unity. I want you to know that unity does not equal uniformity. Unif 
uniformity is about sameness, but unity is about oneness. The goal of biblical unity is not sameness. When you're a new believer, I thought you had to dress the same and act the same and pray the same. I thought that being a Christian meant you had to go and love Chick-fil-A. Then I realized it is. I thought that I had to listen to K-Love and wear a WWJD bracelet. That's not what unity is. It's not sameness. It's not cloning ourselves together. It's being able to come with all of our differences and submit to our conductor, Jesus Christ. So let me keep clarifying unity here because you got to hear this. Because unity is a loaded world, word in this culture, okay? It's a loaded word. Our culture sees unity as mutual tolerance, where we agree in everything and we all try to get along. It's unity for unity's sake. But I'm here to tell you that the biblical idea is much deeper. Biblical unity is much different. Biblical unity is centered on Christ and his word. Paul says that we are to be like-minded and in full accord. Well, how is that possible? How in the world, with all that your differences do you become like-minded? Well, let me tell you, one of the most beautiful things that he has given us for our unity is the word of God. How, how with all the opinions, how with all the philosophy, how with all the different views, how can we be like-minded? Well, we have this compass, and it's the word of God. You hear me? We have a compass, it's the word of God, and if you trust it, and we trust it together, this can bring our minds in unity and our spirits in oneness. And I thank God for the word of God in this culture right now. I thank God. We have this compass, and the problem is, and hear me on this, it might be the best part, the problem is too many Christians in an attempt to pursue unity are willing to compromise biblical integrity. This is not true unity. This is not unity that Christ died for. Jesus did not come to tolerate sins. He came to die for them. I'm all for sacrifice in love. But there is a time where as Christians, we can't sacrifice at the altar the truth of God and his word. And it's happening, church, and they're calling it unity. Martin Luther has this amazing quote, and he says, peace if possible, but truth at all costs. Biblical unity does not involve compromise. There's essentials of the faith, the authority of Scripture, the virgin birth, grace through, we're saved by grace through faith. It's not by works. Those are things that we never back down on and call it unity. Unity is when you stand up for the truth because the Bible says the truth is the only thing that can set them free. So hear me very clear on this. We have to hold fast. But then there's these non-essentials, end times, worship style, modes of baptism, and we have to be able to disagree in love. And Augustine said it really good. He's one of the church fathers. He said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, love. So we're going to come to a close here. The worship band can come. And I want to close with this. Biblical unity is obtained by God, but it's maintained by us. While unity is a gift, church, and it's found in Christ, hear me very clearly. You have to work for it. You have to fight for it. You have to stand against things that are keeping you apart. You've got to stand against the divisiveness. And believe me, the wolves are here, and they are. they are going to be putting the bait right before you. And maybe for some of you, 
you do need to get off social media because you know that that's the place that gets your flesh the most. Maybe for others of you, you need to, to forgive somebody in the body of Christ. That maybe there's someone in this church that has hurt you so deeply and you need to release forgiveness because grudges inside the body can keep us from fulfilling the purposes of our church. If you're with me, somebody say amen. Maybe you need to lay down your need to be right. Humility, more than anything, fosters unity. So as I come to a close, I want to challenge you with the words that Paul says. This is the anthem. This is the word. This is what you go home with. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond. Make every effort, make it your priority. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this incredible Sunday, God. Thank you for the opportunity um, to just to hear a word from you. And I just ask you that you would just change the posture of our hearts, that we would be full of love, that we would be full of understanding, that we would be quick to listen, slow to speak. But Lord, at the same time, that we would never compromise truth. So Holy Spirit, fill us up in the wonderful name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen. amen.